I love simple math. And I think simple math is the freedom for business owners trying to get to that next level before they increase their complexity and resist the brand. But I call it ROAS. It's a little cheeky. There's my dad joke of the day. But it's not your traditional ROAS, which is return on all advertising spend. Mine is return on all sales and marketing spend. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works. And he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more, so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. Driving profitable sales is the key. And as you're going to hear from our guest, a lot of business owners have no idea if what they're selling is profitable after covering all the costs, overhead, and marketing. So just throwing money at marketing and hoping that it stokes the fire, more often than not, creates a business that's just burning cash. And let's face it, that is not a good idea. Yes, we do need to drive revenue, but it needs to have positive cash flow as an outcome. And we'll explain all of that today. Kyle Mealy is a fractional chief revenue officer who works with small businesses. He's helped entrepreneurs increase year-over-year profits by 10x. Over the course of his career, businesses leveraging his knowledge achieve an average of 35% year-over-year top-line revenue growth. He likes to speak about practical lessons and methodologies extracted from helping other business owners and their leaders turn their visions into reality. Let's meet Kyle and see how to do this. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Kyle Mealy. It's great to have you join us today. Uh, Rocky, I'm so grateful to spend a little time with you. As am I. We already had a wonderful conversation and we hadn't even hit record yet. so. That's what happens for the rest of you. There's, there's all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Yes. So I'm Kyle Mealy, founder of Next Level. We do small business fractional chief revenue officer services. I've got this belief that small businesses under 10 million need to think about marketing and sales as though they're one department. And you need to do it in, of course, a profit first way. You know, when I think about these business owners and the concept of marketing and sales, for most of them, I think they think it's their job as the owner or they're trying to hire salespeople. And, and I always tell them the same thing. Salespeople are really good at selling you on giving you them a job, but they're not always so good about selling what you have to sell. That's a little bit of a different game. And when it comes to marketing, 
if there's one line item that I think has a lot of waste in it, it's marketing. Because if you ask them which marketing works, they're like, I don't know. How did these people show up? I don't know. Do you ask? They do ask. But having that concept is just a struggle. And I know, you know, when you look at your website, it's all about, hey, how do we use simple math for predictable results? And I love that. That's kind of what we like to look at. And you handle one small piece of what I look at, the the whole big picture. So let's talk about that. What First of all, let's define kind of what is the difference between marketing and sales and how do they go together? Because I'll tell you, like for me, this podcast is marketing. And what it does is it completes the sale and they just show up on my calendar and want to buy. So I love that. But how does it go together? You know, I think I'm going to start with where what we kind of expect marketing to be. You know, when most people think about marketing, they really start at kind of the Super Bowl idea. And I always laugh because like people, what is good marketing? Oh, the Budweiser commercial, the was up. And it's like, no, that's good marketing when you have a giant brand, right? We're not like that. Most of us don't have a giant brand. So marketing to me becomes about education and interruption. Like, so when I think about marketing, I'm usually talking about those two things. I'm interrupting kind of how somebody thinks or not in a negative, like loud, spammy thing, but an interruption of like creating cognitive dissonance. So like I would say in like what I teach my my clients and, and what our team evangelizes is let's stop thinking about marketing and sales as two separate entities. Let's think of it as one revenue department and it's going to make our lives a lot easier because of the concept of multi-touch attribution, right? To your point, Rocky, like you do marketing and sales is easy. Well, that's because if we really think about sales, sales is just continuing the marketing conversation. It's just reaffirming in a one-to-one way of what we promised them in marketing. And so if we have two different entities, marketing and sales, and we think of them differently, we're going to create two different messages, two different goals, and you're going to have icky sales and loud marketing and nobody makes any money. So like you are already doing, this podcast is instead of selling, you know, one to one, you're selling one to many. And so that's what I, and, and you're interrupting and you're educating. I'm not interrupting. People choose to come here. <laughs> and that's what I like about it. That's fair. That's fair. All right. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I like the fact that I don't have to interrupt. I like the fact that people are opting in. It, you know, it's more of that Seth Godin kind of marketing, right? Permission marketing. Yep. Hey, I'm going to offer you tons of value and come hang out and, and listen. And, you know, if it makes sense, great. And if it doesn't, hey, at least you learned and go off on it. Let me say this, part of the fun of marketing, even in permission marketing, even in SEO, even on a podcast, you do have to make your podcast appealing. And there are a lot of podcasts to listen to. And so, you know, the marketing piece in my mind is that flavor that you put over top. That makes sense. Yeah. And there are a ton of podcasts that are out there and and there's a ton of options for people to choose from. And so I do understand that. And I appreciate the people who do listen. And we also answer questions. Like if people email us and say, hey, can you answer this? We're like, sure. So we kind of believe in planting forests one seed at a time. And it's okay if they don't join or they go like, because I have people come on. I actually have my competitors come on the podcast. I'm like, come listen to them. Maybe they're better for you. Go join them. I'm okay with that. So it's a lot of fun to do that. I I love that approach. And I think Back to the salespeople, the the kind of like salespeople are good at selling their selves for a job. Um, that's when a lot of business owners end up calling me is kind of when they've had that real struggle, you know, by replacing themselves in the sales seat and, and getting someone else in. They got sold. And I always come back to, do you have, and I'm going to take this from my friend, Kenny, his brilliant way of saying it. He goes, don't hire a mercenary. You think you want a mercenary in sales, hire a missionary. Hire someone who believes what you believe, thinks like you think, and wants to educate first, and that's it. And it feels like, Rocky, that's your approach. And that's what the podcasting is too. And so when, I, when I'm counseling people on their first sales hire, you think you want the door pounder. You really want the someone who's just willing to share and give. Well, and I think part of that, though, is 
before you hire somebody, you need to know what your sales process is. <laughs> okay. You need to know, the, here's the question that most people don't know the answer to. Why are they buying from you? And what is truly the problem they are trying to solve, right? People don't buy a drill because they want a drill. People buy a drill because they want a hole. And they want a hole because they want something that that hole provides, right? Nobody's going, I want a hole. And so it's understanding that and understanding the problem that you're solving and how to do that. And then removing all the friction from the entire process. And making the experience wonderful. And these days, it seems to be getting worse and worse. And so if you stand out like that, you automatically will start to win over your competition. Yeah, I, I don't really, you know, think of my competition. And, and like you, you know, I, somebody once said, well, wouldn't you be worried in this group if there were another fractional CRO like you? They're like, listen. I'll take half, you take half. And I would say that for one third, I'd take that for one quarter. There's plenty out there. And again, those are the kind of signals that I use to find someone. And those are the kind of things I want business owners like thinking about in their marketing and thinking about in their sales because that resonates. You can smell if it's about me or if it's about you. And I think that's what you're touching on in making it frictionless and actually thinking about what is that person trying to do with the solution I'm selling you or, or offering you and, and what problem does it build, solve for me? And I think too often we, we forget that little piece because we get so lost in the business or maybe the, our own expertise and we make it more complicated than it has to be. I can't tell you how many times I run into that. I think a lot of times we want to sell our features and benefits and not necessarily the solution that the client is looking for. And I think that's where a lot of it gets out of line. But let's not get into the weeds. Let's kind of take a step back. What you do is help people drive profitable revenue, correct? Yeah. So go ahead and tell us how you do this. Yeah, it started with this idea that most small businesses are still immature in their marketing and sales. And I don't mean that as a negative. It's, it's hard, right? You put out your shingle and then you get to a point where you're kind of doing it. You've got people helping you. And then you have to solve marketing and sales. And at that point, you usually start to have this question of profitability, right? When do you add more pieces? When do you spend on marketing? And that becomes a really difficult question. And we're not talking about big businesses with big bank accounts and big lines of credit. You know, you miss by 10% and it's like, oh my gosh, what, where's that cash coming from? It's coming from my own pocket. And so one of the things that I think about and, you know, I preach and I teach and I practice myself is if you don't know your profitability and if you don't know your margin, stop spending a dime on marketing and sales, like stop, full stop, because how are you pricing if you don't understand margin? I can't tell you how many times I've run into businesses where they're pricing and they don't know their margin and they're wondering why they're running out of cash because they're selling a product that costs more than it to fulfill than they can actually sell it for. I, I see you, Rocky, you've run into this a few times. Yes, but let's not think that it's just a small business that faces this. Every time Ford and General Motors sells an EV, they're losing more money than the car costs. Big companies do this too. It's amazing. It's, it's a human problem. We really don't understand and we don't put all the components of cost into there and we don't keep up with it. So like the, just today, I had a conversation with one of my clients and they're building out a better proposal system and automating it. And in doing that process, he's like, whoa, I didn't realize my costs had gone up so much. Because of supply chain, now it just brought it to bear that, hey, I do have to keep an eye on this. And we try to have people with dynamic pricing, meaning when you build out something like that, we're always tracking inputs. And every time you buy something, we update the inputs or somebody on your team does it. You don't do all this work. So that if you're in that kind of business with a heavy input cost, we're 
always able to keep up with inflation and changes that are going on. Yes. I joke about, you know, the new power duo in small business is, you know, the the financial leader and then this small business chief revenue officer. And most marketers that I've ever come across say, sure, let's go spend a bunch of money, which makes almost anybody who's really thinking about the bottom line, which every business owner must, it's not a should, it's a must, because that's what gives your team and yourself more opportunity to do the work you're good at and take care of yourself. Like, sorry, you, you get to take care of yourself when you take this risk. Sorry, stepping off my soapbox. The other thing that most sales teams do and orgs do that I've seen is they kind of have to overpromise. And if there isn't trust between the financial results and the marketing and the sales team and how they're spending money and how they're projecting how much money is going to come in, that's when so many bad things happen. So I love finding businesses that think about profit. And so what you're doing is you're talking about the timing of cash flow. And every business is different. But I think if you don't know, you can get yourself in trouble. And this is the thing that I think people don't realize. Growth costs cash. And if you don't have enough cash for growth, it is highly possible that you will grow and go bankrupt or run out of cash, which is essentially the same thing, and get yourself into trouble. And so yes. this is all predictable, right? Yeah. And so we can actually sit down and do this. Yeah. you. I mean, you showed me that very, very powerful tool that you have. And I, I have a similar tool that I would put right in front of yours um, that you know starts at the lead level. Actually, it doesn't start at the lead level. Mine starts at above the lead level. It starts at the marketing awareness level. Like how many people are experiencing your brand? How in gosh, the gift of digital arrow, you can kind of have a pretty good sense of how many people saw your LinkedIn post, how many people visited your website. Like that was it was much harder before analytics. And so if you can really see that top level, you can start to see how many people come to your door. Once you see how many come to your door, you see how many you're giving an opportunity and an offer for. And then you can see how many close. And if you can work backwards, you can really start to see if I lift you know, the ceiling of my marketing, if I raise it by, and I'm not saying go spend $10,000 to lift it. I'm saying, let's go spend $500 and see what happens the whole way down. Um, I call this the revenue cascade. When you have that, and then you know how much it costs to lift your ceiling up, and you know how much it costs to sell a product, you have a license to print money. Now, it's not that simple but at least the concepts are that simple. And I think this is where people struggle is they don't know how to spend that $500 and they don't know necessarily how to measure it and also the timing of how to measure it. Because, you know, some businesses you could spend $500 and you get an order tomorrow. In some businesses you spend $500 and you don't get an order for nine months. And so understanding those things. So how do we figure that out? All right, Rocky, you're making me give away my secret sauce, but I'll do it for you. <laughs> I love simple math. And I think simple math is the freedom for business owners trying to get to that next level before they increase their complexity, couldn't resist the brand. But I call it ROAS. It's a little cheeky. There's my dad joke of the day. But it's not your traditional ROAS, which is return on all advertising spend. Mine is return on all sales and marketing spend. And so what I teach my clients to do, and, and frankly, we do it for them because in most businesses, you don't have the leverage to like have a lot of people doing this work. So we come in and we get our hands dirty. And what we do is we help them. And again, financials are key. What did I tell you? First thing I need my clients to do is understand their profit. And if you don't, have a full visibility to all your expenses and income, like it's really hard to do our work. And so it's usually kind of going in hand in hand. We bucket all the sales and marketing expenses, like everything that fits in there. Uh, it's your salary, it's your commissions, it's your any upsell. And then we just simply put revenue over top of it. And we divide those two numbers. It's a very simple ratio. And for most businesses, if you can get between six and eight on that number, you're doing very well, very healthy. Most of the time when a company calls me, they realize that number is much lower than six. 
or they want to spend a bunch of money and they don't know how it'll impact things. So when I think about how do we spend that $500, I think about it in terms of that first. It's like, do we have $500 to spend? How do we know? And some companies do and some companies don't. <laughs> and it depends on on that particular case. So if I get this right, though, the six to eight is basically six to eight percent of sales or is it slightly different? Yeah, it's slightly different because you're also including marketing. But yeah, I would say the inverse of it is that you're going to get end up between like a six and eight ends up being between eight and 12 percent of total sales. It's just a different way to kind of do the math. All right. So you're budgeting for a marketing budget, which includes salaries, advertising costs, everything else of somewhere between eight and 12%. And again, like if you're the business owner and you're the male salesperson, then part of that salary of yours goes to that eight to 12%. And you allocate it. Well, and this is where, you know, we can kind of like think about that's why I like the ratio versus the percentage, because yes, you can allocate your owner draw or your owner salary in there, but I just think about it, the efficiency. Okay. And so I like the number on, instead of a percentage is a budget. I think of it as a score. I think, it, did I win this month or did I lose this month? And then I also like to do it over time. And so, you know, I'll give an example. One client they had, when I came in, they had no visibility to any of this stuff, really. They were at a 1.17. So very simply, it means they were spending, you know, a dollar in sales and marketing to get a dollar and 17 cents in cash, like in revenue. And so well, you're going to go out of business tomorrow with that. <laughs> Guess what happened three months after I walked in? They ran into a serious cash crunch. Before that happened, I had cut down a lot of their expenses in sales and marketing because they Come to find out they had a you know, sales team that was about a half million dollars and had only brought in four or five deals that year. But it, this became so simple. And what was nice is we could see this incremental change over time. I started making those moves. Now, it took a little while for new sales to come in because we were doing the wrong activities, too. But at least we weren't going to lose our, our entire business because we weren't watching that. So by the end, we were up to about a, a six average. Whole different game. Much healthier business. So how do businesses track all of this stuff if they wanted to? Well, you'll see my profit first mentality here, right? And it's this question of, well, what, you know, how much do you have? Because if you have a big budget and you're very profitable, well, okay, then buy speed here. But most don't. And once they have the visibility to these numbers, then you can start making smart decisions. So I have one client that's fairly startup-y and we were talking about a CRM. Why were we talking about a CRM? Because we had grown fast enough and big enough that Sheets was becoming overwhelming. We couldn't manage it through Sheets. So a lot of my companies start with Sheets and a lot of, again, if keyboards were dirtier, my hands would be dark black like my kids after you know coloring for an hour. What I would say is you know, start with Sheets. Start simple. Don't overcomplicate. And then there are cheap CRMs. You don't need a $13,000 Salesforce implementation. Zoho is $34 a month or something. Or Monday.com even has a cheap CRM now. So that's you know kind of where I would go next, depending on their complexity and their cash. Well, even though you have a CRM, they can't always get the numbers out of it. Because a lot of them don't have great reporting or great stats. Or the people aren't properly utilizing them. Usually that's an outcome of inexperience or, you know, just I keep coming into overly complex things. Like one of the first commandments I usually have when I come in or one of my team comes in is let's simplify. What's extraneous? Because if it's not getting done, it's, it's usually, it's rarely because they don't care. Like if a sales team member isn't updating their CRM, it's rarely because they don't care. It's usually because they don't know how or they don't know why it matters. And if they don't know why it matters, they're not going to do it. And so I go back and I go, why did we put this in? Not in a judgment, just like, help me understand. It's like, oh, somebody told us. <laughs> oh, what does this have to do with anything we're trying to achieve? Nothing. All right. Well, maybe we don't need to do this. So we actually get the stuff in there that matters. How do you get people to get their salespeople to change? 
because that seems to be a very difficult journey. And more often than not, the story I hear is we tried and then we replaced. (laughs) I'm not a replacer. I really hate that. Don't get me wrong. I've had to turn people over if, you know, they don't do the things we need them to do. But, you know, my approach is generally this. Teach them the method. My win, an example of a win is we brought ROAS into a company. We brought the marketing team into the sales meeting because there was tension between marketing and sales. They were living in two different islands and thinking the other was an idiot. So we brought them together and we talked about an event. And I started to know that this was going to work because the salespeople were saying, no, we don't want to do that event. That event stunk. Our buyers weren't there. And that's going to cost us on ROAS because you're going to go spend money on that that we're not going to get anything for. And all of a sudden, we were having a different conversation. And it's much easier to get a salesperson to do things I need to do when they have buy-in on where the leads are coming. And if they don't choose to engage in the ROAS, that's usually a red flag for me. If they're not really seeing the bigger picture of the health of the business, then I don't want them selling for me. Well, and so this is why we talk about sales compensation, because if you give sales reps the ability to discount and it doesn't affect their paycheck, I guarantee you they're going to discount left and right. And you better be careful that your discount doesn't take you below your margin, right? Rocky, I hate discounts <laughs> for this exact reason. Because like you've just now reset the bottom of what your price is. And usually it's at the cost of margin. And the most you know thing that I would say most businesses do not do a good enough job of protecting is their margin. Yeah. Now, sometimes they have to wake up and smell the coffee that you're overpriced and you maybe have a, you know, an operations bloat issue. Generally, sometimes it's a lot of marketing waste, but we don't give away money without it being at a consequence. And this is back to the ROAS conversation because it's like Johnny salesperson gave away 20% on that. Well, now we have 20% less revenue in our number that we're accountable for, and that's hurting everybody. And so I definitely feel like shared fate matters there. I definitely feel like there is, you know, I tend to tie bonuses in salespeople's comps to this ROAS number because it's all based on margin. Mm -hmm. So sure. And that's when discounts don't feel so icky to me. It's like, sure, you want to give away 10%. You just make it, you have to sell more now. I'm okay with that. (laughs) What are some of the biggest mistakes you notice people make in that, in this space? Um, we've kind of touched on it. So I think this is a good time to talk about that. You know, what do I do with $500? And the most dangerous thing I see people do, and I'm going to move off of sales because I think we've, we've kind of hit sales pretty hard and there's plenty of fruit in there, but let's talk a little bit more about marketing here. And what do we do with $500 and how do we make sure it comes back well? And I introduced a concept called the primary business challenge that marketing needs to solve. And it is a way to filter which tactics people choose. Because most of the time what happens is, you know, a CEO will see a LinkedIn post or see a talk or see a, or listen to a podcast and say, you got to do paid to advertise. You got to do pay-per-click. We got to do pay-per-click. And so they go write a check to an agency to do pay-per-click. Three months later, they can't find any money from it. And they're all upset. And then, then it's on to the next thing. And so what I say is, what is the primary business challenge your marketing has to solve? And I'll ask it this way, Rocky, have you ever heard of shower space? No. Of course you haven't. I know you haven't. Shower space is this guy, Patrick. He's a good guy. He approached, this was a long time ago now, a company I was working for when I was doing marketing for a marketing agency. And he came and wanted to do marketing and he wanted to do search engine optimization or SEO. And I go, Patrick, nobody knows what your product is. Nobody knows to search for it. Now, what shower space is, and I'm going to explain it very quickly and you're going to get it. He's six foot three, this guy, and it's an angled shower curtain. So imagine a shower curtain normally goes up. It angles right about the spot where you would be washing your hair. Now, this is not a problem I would ever have to worry about, but he's six foot three. He's in the shower with this gorgeous head of hair and his elbows aren't touching the icky shower curtain or the wall. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. I get it now. Shower space. I get it. And so I bucket that is the primary business challenge that shower space needs to solve is awareness. I'm doing awareness marketing for him right now. There's a lot of tactics you can do for awareness. 
Facebook ads is a really good one. You're interrupting people and it's visual. So if somebody sees Patrick with his luscious locks, with his arms like this, my wife would be like, well, that's been a problem I've had before. I get it. I would like to be interested in that. So most people don't do that exercise. So there's four of these primary business challenges. Awareness is one. The second is visibility. I think about visibility as like, I call it the locksmith problem. Rocky, do you have a locksmith that you just go to when you have a locksmithing problem? No. Nobody does. So what do you do? You open up your search on Google and you, you look at the one with the best reviews who shows up at top. It's what we all do. So that's visibility. You have to be found when they're looking for you, not for your brand, but what you do. Plumbers, electricians, lawyers tend to fall into that category. The third is differentiation. That's our common one. We, most of us think about differentiation all the time. But if you're not in it, like shower space has no competitors. He doesn't need to be different. He doesn't need to spend a lot of time on that. And the fourth one, the final one is trust. And so this is when it's your life. It's your financials. It's a big business transaction. It's a big transaction. So I would say the Mayo Clinic. Do we know if the Mayo Clinic is really successful? We sure feel like it. If I was dying of some terrible disease and no doctor around me could diagnose it, where would I go? Mayo Clinic. So whatever the Mayo Clinic is doing on trust, it's working because we would trust them with our life. At least, you know, I, maybe not exactly, but at least you get where I'm going with that. And so when you answer that question and you understand kind of what your business has to do, the tactics become more obvious. And I think that's what we see a lot of times is people implement tactics because they need, I need sales, go do some Facebook ads. What do the Facebook ads say? I don't know. We sell X and they don't think through all these things. They don't target appropriately. And now it's harder than ever, I think, to target, meaning Facebook used to have much better targeting. Nowadays, yep, iOS killed that. Yep. Yeah, you have to do it differently. And if you don't know, then you know, you spend a thousand dollars in Facebook ads, which you can do in a blink of an eye. And now not only do you have no sales, but now you have no money for the next advertising campaign. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that story. The fact that you said it as I've heard it so many times. And then worse yet, and I used to see this when I was at the agency, and this is where it kind of really where my business started was, you would have this great sales leader who's trying to steer marketing and had no idea what they're doing. And so they're like, send it all on pay-per-click. And it's like, you have a shower space problem. <laughs> it's not going to work. No one knows to look for shower space and type it in and see you on paid search. And Or I'd say the invert. You have this killer marketing leader who'd come up with these clever tactics. They'd get tons of leads. And then the business owner would come on and say, we're not getting any sales. And the marketing team would go, talk to sales. And we'd be like, nobody told sales we were going to be doing this. And I just, that's when I decided I was going to solve that problem. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of this requires what I call thinking time. And most business owners are busy doing, and they don't like the thinking part of it. Right. They'd rather just take action in instead of saying, wait a minute, you know, we really have to answer these harder questions. And then we have to test to see if that's truly what it is, because I think a lot of times we guess and we don't know the truth. And, you know, I get going off your gut, but if you don't know the math behind it, and you don't know the real reason people are doing what they're doing, I think a lot of this becomes 10x harder. Oh, and it's why there's frustration. It's why I have a role. It's why you're here. And, and you know, I can see just the, the edge of the cover behind you. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about traction in that book and that system called EOS. They talk about, you know, small business owners as the visionary, and they tend to just be these action takers. And they, they have a good gut instinct and it usually serves them well until you run into problems like these. And so, you know, I love when they when they get their counterpart and EOS calls it the integrator. Some of us would know it as like a VP of ops or second in command or whatever you want to call it. 
And so that was one of the things I had to do in my own business. And I, it's one of the things I really care about is practicing what I preach. So I have that role in my business because sometimes I go too fast. Sometimes I just want to get the stuff done. And so it, it doesn't just apply to sales and marketing. It applies in your finance. It applies in how you build your team. So the short answer is don't have to be the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> or you brought the wrong people to the room. Yeah. <laughs> that could be. As a leader, as the owner, you, you decide who's in the room. <laughs> as we close out here, is there anything else that we should have covered that we didn't get a chance to? Oh, my goodness. Did I ever mention that you should really think about profit first before you start spending money on marketing and sales? Just want to make sure I, I said that at least. <laughs> I laugh, but I just can't tell you how many times I wish when I come into a business and I, I want to look at the financials, I know it kind of breaks their brain because usually marketers try and hide from the financials because that usually where, where the no lives. But I care about healthy businesses and that's where it starts. Healthy businesses become long-term clients. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. My job's a little easier. And the other part I would say to it is they take care of their people better. They do. There's a lot fear and anxiety. There's less uncertainty. They can make smarter moves. And most of the business owners I know care deeply about their teams. And, yeah. they, and they want to take care of their teams. And if they're not taking care of their money, they won't be able to take care of their team. And that is entirely true. If people would like to learn more about your services, find you, what's the best way for them to do that? LinkedIn, my name, Kyle Mealy, or our website is ready for the next level.com. And then I have a free tool that is available. You might not find it right away, depending on when this launches. We're updating it called the Revenue Cascade. It is basically understanding your, your waterfall of revenue from awareness all the way to sale and then helping that turn into predictable. It's actionable tool for you all. Awesome. And we'll put a link to the website in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Rocky. How do you look at marketing and sales efforts? Do they go together? Are they separate? Does your marketing create clients who are ready to buy from you? Are your salespeople nothing more than order takers? These are big questions that require clarity. Also, do you know if your sales are profitable and by what margin? when factoring in all the costs? Because if you don't, you don't need more resources or sales. You need to be more resourceful and make sure that we're focusing on the bottom line and each and every one of those sales produces profit and excess cash flow for your business. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one -on -one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done-for-you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.